welcome. This is Dr. Len Calabrese from the R.J. Fazenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology here at the Cleveland Clinic, um, and we're going to put on another uh, round of e-journal club for this year. Uh, I am very uh, excited uh, about this article called Inflammatory Arthritis and Zika Syndrome Induced by Nivolumab and Ipilimumab. This was published in uh, the June uh, issue of the Annals of Rheumatic Disease, and we have the first author, Laura Capelli, with us, who's an instructor in medicine at Johns Hopkins. Let me just set the, 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 a little bit of the background before um, uh, we have Laura come in here. Um, the last five years have seen major changes in, in the therapeutic targeting of cancer with the evolution of immunotherapy. Um, immunotherapy has been a, a dream of oncologists for decades, and it has been uh, a field that has been limited by uh, fits and starts uh, with um, previous therapies being ineffective or having unacceptable toxicity. The last few years uh, have uh, uh, seen the introduction of uh, what uh, Laura is going to describe as checkpoint inhibitors that have really transformed certain malignancies. Uh, we have now a handful of drugs that are approved. Um, uh, uh, they're being used in combinatorial fashion. There are many, many other drugs on the way. And uh, as a result, uh, we are seeing an array of uh, interesting and challenging inflammatory adverse events that are calling in other specialists, uh, as, and, and in particular rheumatologists. Um, while rheumatologic adverse events are not the most common, they certainly are um, uh, some of the most complex. And in the, as these drugs now gravitate to the community, uh, there's a great need for awareness, um, for clinicians to be able to recognize and diagnose and manage these in uh, interprofessional uh, partnership with uh, oncologists. So I, I've been very interested in these mechanisms for a long time, but had not seen uh, any of these patients um, uh, till I invited Dr. Bingham up here earlier this year to share this experience uh, with us uh, at, from Hopkins. And since that time, uh, we've, we've become very active in this area as well. So uh, uh, Laura, welcome to eJournal Club, and uh, I'm gonna turn the con over to you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be doing research in this field, and um, I'm happy to be here to discuss our group's paper, which was published online in, in June of this year. So to go into some background about these drugs that are the center of this paper, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, these are medications that are used to treat advanced cancer, and the mechanism of action involves blocking the negative regulation of T cells, thus enhancing the anti-tumor response. And the target of the two drugs we focus on in this paper, the targets are PD-1 uh, for nivolumab and CTLA-4 for ipilimumab. And this nonspecific immune activation that leads to an anti-tumor response can unfortunately also lead to tissue damage, which are known as immune-related adverse events. To look at how these drugs work, um, we have a little schematic here uh, of the T cell, the antigen presenting cell, and tumor cell with and without uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab. In the top panel, panel A, you can see that um, without these blocking antibodies, there are negative interactions between the T cell and the, both the antigen presenting cell and tumor cell that prevent T cell activation. And those are the binding of PD1 to its ligand, PDL1 or PDL2, on antigen presenting cells or tumor cells, and also the binding of CTLA4 on the T cell to B7 on antigen presenting cells. And all of those interactions are um, negative regulation for the T cells and prevent activation. Now, when you go to panel B and you add these immune checkpoint inhibitors to the mix, you're actually blocking the negative regulation of the T cell to allow activation to occur. So you can see that um, ipilimumab, the anti-CTLA-4 antibody, is blocking CTLA-4, thus allowing B7 to bind to CD28 and causing T cell activation. 
And you can also see that when you add nivolumab, the anti-PD-1 antibody, it blocks the interaction between PD-1 and its ligands, um, thus also allowing T cell activation. So going to the next slide, um, why did we write this case series? Well, we started several years ago, back in 2013, 2000, even 2012, receiving referrals uh, of patients with new inflammatory arthritis and sicka syndrome after treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it took a few years to um, all put our heads together and realize that this was um, not just a fluke, and we were actually seeing uh, de novo rheumatic disease after treatment with these drugs. And looking through the literature, we realized that there were only small case reports published, and there was nothing published on sicka syndrome. So we wanted to share our experience with these new clinical entities, and we really wanted to spark discussion and investigation in both the fields of rheumatology and oncology. So going on to the methods, um, the methods are fairly simple. Um, this was a case series of patients who develop new onset inflammatory arthritis or sicka syndrome after treatment with the immune checkpoint inhibitors ifilimumab and um, or nivolumab. And patients were only included if they had no prior diagnosed autoimmune disease. We presented their demographic information, cancer history and cancer treatment, the clinical features of the immune-related adverse events, the inflammatory arthritis or sicka syndrome, laboratory features, imaging, and how these immune-related adverse events were treated. Um, it's important to note that this, um, this group of patients does not represent all of the patients that we had seen at this time. We were, um, we were prevented in publishing a few of our cases due to publication embargoes in patients whose clinical trials had not yet reported their primary outcomes. So um, we respected that, and we did work with Bristol-Myers Squibb to ensure the accuracy of the data of the clinical trial patients included, as they're the makers of nivolumab and ipilimumab. Bristol-Myers Squibb, however, did not have any um, editorial input or um, involvement in writing the manuscript. They just were checking the data of clinical trial participants for accuracy. So moving on to the results. Looking at the group as a whole, there were nine patients with inflammatory arthritis and four with sicka syndrome. When we looked at what type of cancer the patients had, most patients had uh, metastatic melanoma. There are six of them. And this reflects the earlier approval um, and, and use in trials of immunotherapy for metastatic melanoma. There are five patients with uh, non-small cell lung cancer, one with small cell lung cancer, and one with renal cell carcinoma. And when we looked how people were treated, um, it was interesting to note that the majority of patients had received these drugs in combination. And we know from information on other immune-related adverse events, such as colitis, that they are much um, more prevalent when you use the therapies in combination. So this may end up being true for inflammatory arthritis and sicka. And five of the patients were treated with either nivolumab or ipilimumab monotherapy. Um, we also looked at the tumor response to treatment, which is measured by um, radiologists reading serial CT scans, something called the rhesus criteria, which is used by oncologists to measure um, how patients respond in terms of their tumor burden on imaging. And so one patient had a complete response, a complete regression of tumor. Six patients had a partial response, um, re meaning a partial regression of their tumor. So seven out of their 13, or the slight majority, responded to the drugs, which is um, actually higher than is seen in a lot of the clinical trials um, and may uh, indicate that there's a possible connection between tumor response and developing adverse events. That's still a very open question uh, within oncology. Moving on to the next slide, where we focus on inflammatory arthritis, we noted that there were three main clinical phenotypes in our population. Six of the patients, or the majority, had a rheumatoid arthritis-like phenotype. They had involvement of the small joints of the hands, the wrists, also some of the large joints, an inflammatory polyarthritis that, if you looked at them clinically, was not distinguishable from RA. More interestingly, I think, um, two patients had a very classic reactive arthritis phenotype with all of the features sterile urethritis, conjunctivitis, and an inflammatory arthritis. Um, and the arthritis was quite inflammatory. 
So that was very interesting to see, as we don't often see reactive arthritis in, in our clinical practice. And then there was a patient who had more of a spondyloarthritis phenotype with larger joint involvement and some inflammatory back pain. To note, um, antibodies, rheumatoid factor and CCP antibodies were negative in all nine of these patients, um, which is a clear distinction between um, our patients and those with classic inflammatory arthritis. ANAs were positive in three out of nine, but only one had a high titer positive ANA. When the synovial fluid was evaluated in these patients, and we had samples from four of the patients, all of it was inflammatory with a neutrophil predominance, greater than 70%. And imaging in selected patients showed synovitis and joint effusions, um, as you would see in other forms of inflammatory arthritis. Um, what we also found that was interesting was that five out of nine of these patients with inflammatory arthritis also had another immune-related adverse event. And so colitis, thyroiditis, and hypophysitis, or inflammation of the pituitary gland, uh, were seen in those patients. Moving on to the next slide, how do we treat these patients with inflammatory arthritis? Well, prednisone was the main stay of therapy, as it is for many of the immune-related adverse events. Um, and the doses ranged widely from 10 to 120 milligrams daily. Now, we did not <laughs> start the patient on 120 milligrams daily. Um, that, that was started by oncology, and, and then the patient came to our attention. But um, overall, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this in outcomes, but the doses needed of corticosteroids were much higher than would be expected for inflammatory arthritis. Intraarticular corticosteroids were useful in these patients, particularly those with large joints involved, and were used in five out of nine. And TNF inhibitors, either etanercept or adalimumab, were used in three patients and methotrexate in two patients. So how did these patients do? Um, it was variable, and the response to corticosteroids was particularly variable. Some patients needed only 10 milligrams or so to respond, but most patients needed much higher dosing. And some patients did not respond to extended courses of corticosteroids. Those patients who went on to TNF inhibitors did have good responses to TNF inhibition. So to talk about the Sicka syndrome patients on the next slide, there are four patients. And what was notable about these four patients is that the salivary hypofunction was the more bothersome symptom for all of them um, compared to the dry eyes. And one out of the four patients had parotitis. Um, and that was responsive to steroids. Three out of these four patients had a positive ANA, one had a positive LA antibody, and no patients had positive Rho. Um, of these patients, they also had concurrent um, immune-related adverse events, and one of them had concurrent pneumonitis. Now, interestingly, in this patient, um, in his battery of autoantibody testing, an EJ antibody or one of the antisynthetase antibodies came back positive. And we don't know if that's significant. It is thought-provoking as interstitial lung disease is one of the main manifestations of antisynthetase syndrome. So definitely food for thought. Um, and there were other immune-related adverse events seen. Um, one patient really um, had a bunch. Uh, in one patient, Sicka syndrome, interstitial nephritis, colitis, and new insulin-dependent diabetes, um, all in the same person. So a rough go of it for that patient. Um, so those were our observations of the patients in this case series. And to conclude, I would say that inflammatory arthritis and Sicka syndrome um, can occur as a result of treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We reported only on nivolumab and ipilimumab, but certainly other groups have reported on other immune checkpoint inhibitors, and we have seen patients with um, both the FDA-approved and investigational um, other drugs uh, develop these events. And though some of these features um, of rheumatic immune-related adverse events are similar to the classical diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's, there are key differences in autoantibodies and response to treatment. And um, we are only beginning to understand these events, and much more research is needed uh, so we can understand the pathogenesis, the epidemiology, risk factors, and how to best treat these rheumatic immune-related adverse events. Well, thanks uh, so much. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, to your to your great credit, uh, uh, well, there have been numerous 
you know, case reports, this is the first time that uh, a series has been put together, and we think it's uh, it's important. This is a new nosologic entity for uh, rheumatologists. So since the publication of this and things are moving so rapidly, um, uh, have, have you continued to see an enlarging spectrum of uh, rheumatic problems? Um. So I actually, that's a great question, and I actually um, just surveyed all of our different centers. Um, the way we're organized at uh, Hopkins is through uh, centers focusing on specific disease entities, and um, they have seen patients in the myositis center, um, not a great number, but they have seen patients with inflammatory myopathies um, that developed after treatment. Uh, interestingly, uh, we haven't seen anybody with lupus, um, after treatment with these uh, these drugs, there continue to be cases of Thicke syndrome, but I think the largest group that we're seeing in increasing number uh, is the inflammatory arthritis. And we're seeing, um, you know, some weeks, we're seeing about one to two patients a week um, on average um, with inflammatory arthritis that's developing as we increase our referral base. Uh, very nice study. I have a question about your experience um, with patients presenting with a polymyalgia rheumatica-like picture, if you've seen any. We have a, a small handful here. One patient in particular we saw last week with very impressive pain and stiffness in his neck and shoulder girdle, hip girdle that was very refractory to high doses of prednisone, I think 60 milligrams in oncology, ended up giving him a dose of infliximab, and he felt essentially back to normal for less than 14 days, and now his symptoms are back rip-roaring on, on prednisone, 60 milligrams. Have you seen any, any of these PMR-like IREs? So I, so I, that is that's a very interesting case, um, and uh, would love to talk further about that. We have not seen anybody that has really classic um, PMR. We have certainly seen um, shoulder and hip girdle involvement um, in patients that have also uh, more peripheral synovitis. But I know uh, at other institutions that we've we've talked to, um, they are continuing to see patients. Um, with a more PMR-like picture. Um, and uh, I think your experience with giving one dose of a TNF inhibitor and symptoms coming back really does speak to what is different about the inflammatory arthritis versus other immune-related adverse events like colitis. Uh, in colitis, it's common practice to give one, maybe two doses of infliximab, and it usually resolves entirely uh, when people have colitis from these drugs. But that has not been our experience uh, with the inflammatory arthritis, and it really does raise questions about what is different in the pathogenesis um, of uh, inflammatory arthritis slash a PMR-type syndrome uh, versus colitis that, um, the tr that a short-term treatment may not be the answer. Our, our experience is uh, it, it's pretty similar to yours, and we have seen... Uh, we've actually seen life-threatening myositis uh, in our small series. Um, we also have anecdotally noted that the Sika it doesn't want to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, once they have it, they seem to have it, and at least in the, the, the our, our group. Have you had any success of remission in this? Um, I think like in... Uh, in classic Sjogren's syndrome, where the dry eyes and the dry mouth can be difficult to treat and not responsive to immunosuppression, we have seen the same thing, that, um, you know, they, it's really symptomatic relief um, with either um, biotin products, eye drops, uh, with, um, you know, uh, Evozac and other medications. But I, we have seen the same thing, that it seems to be pretty persistent once people develop those symptoms. In your experience, did you find that any of these patients had to have their uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy held because of the rheumatic events? Um, yes, we, ha we have had people um, 
where the checkpoint inhibitor has, um, has needed to be held. The myositis patients in particular um, were stopped on their immune checkpoint inhibitors um, due to the severity of their symptoms. But even for arthritis, we have had um, oncologists choose to hold the treatment um, at least for some time uh, if the arthritis was severe enough. Um, the, other the other piece that complicates it is that if people aren't having a clear response or they're having, you know, maybe some tumors are smaller, some are bigger, plus they have these immune-related adverse events, I think oncologists are more likely to want to hold the immunotherapy um, to, to try to get the adverse events under control than when if there's a clear response and um, patients tumors are really shrinking or they go into complete remission, it's a, it's a different calculation. And that's why with every one of these patients, um, we form a tentative plan during the clinic visit, and then I speak to their oncologist and um, confirm the plan with the oncologist because um, the priority for most of these patients is, is certainly treating their cancer. Um, of of course. Um, yeah, I think so. that, that, absolutely. Um, you know, we're we're also very interested in um, patients um, uh, with pre-existing uh, autoimmune diseases, which you censored in this trial. And mm -hmm. as you're well aware, uh, you know, there's a moderately limited literature on this with checkpoint therapy. But you know, what is there suggests that you know, that uh, a variety of uh, autoimmune diseases can flare um, in, the, in the wake of such therapies. Uh, and we're following uh, a small handful of patients with defined rheumatic diseases such as CCP positive, RA, et cetera. What, what's your experience been so far in this group? So I, um, I have treated some patients with rheumatoid arthritis who have gone on immune checkpoint inhibitors, and um, it's, it is, it's difficult uh, to keep their disease under control if it wasn't under control um, before they started therapy. So, for example, I have one gentleman who I diagnosed with RA um, in the months before. He just was unlucky. He developed RA in the months before seropositive, high titer CCB antibodies. Um, he, before he was supposed to start immunotherapy for his metastatic lung cancer. And so I didn't really have a great chance to get his, his disease under control before starting immunotherapy, and the, his oncologist was only comfortable with, um, we ended up using low-dose prednisone, Plaquenil, and sulfasalazine in him. Um, and he's, you know, he's functional, um, he, but he is uh, by no means... Um, you know, in low disease activity or remission from his RA. So it, it really is um, a tough situation if people um, either aren't controlled and they want to start these drugs or if people flare uh, in terms of knowing what to do. Um, and, it, it, and that's why, again, um, I go back to, you know, having a, a discussion with the patient and the oncologist of how likely is this therapy to help what are your goals of um, for the rest of your life, for quality of life, and, um, you know, how can we help achieve that? Uh, I know that um, a couple of scleroderma patients um, have been started on um, immune checkpoint inhibitors, so I'll be interested to see what other diseases besides RA look like um, when people are treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think one of the horizons here is now that these drugs are approved and, you know, these are out of the confines of clinical trials and, you know, there are kind of informal and formal stopping rules uh, uh, that are used in, in, in association with these drugs. And there really needs to be a lot of dialogue. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I don't really know what the 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 – Consequences are of having a patient on checkpoint in therapy uh, it, uh, for for a malignancy and and maintaining you know uh, methotrexate and prednisone for their uh, for their rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, I think these are really three dimensional topics that need to be worked through. I think that just 
knee-jerk responses of, oh, if you're on more than 10 milligrams of prednisone, we're going to hold this, is not realistic given the, the, the you know, the, 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 the patient-centered goals of, of primarily treating the malignancy and then maintaining quality of life. So I think, it, you know, there's a lot lot to, to, to discuss moving ahead, and, and this is not set in stone. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And the 10 milligrams of prednisone, I've tried to figure out where that comes from, and um, I don't think it comes. Yeah, right, nowhere. <laughs> Not from any data, anyway. M I think it's M just M what most clinical trials. Like vaccine had. recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it, it's um, we we really do need to understand um, you because I think the the other problem is that. We don't totally understand how these drugs work in cancer. I, they probably work in many different ways, and, um, you know, the correlative data of who responds and who doesn't hasn't been, um, you know, fully analyzed, and there's not a ton out there even about how these drugs are working for their primary um, goal, which is treating the cancer. So I think if we understand that more um, in depth, that will help us um, – when we pick what drugs we can use to treat, um, what is going to be least likely to abrogate the effect of the immunotherapy? Agree. Well, I think that the, the future is uh, obviously uh, uh, fast moving and fluid. And uh, every time I've discussed this with uh, colleagues in the community, there's a there's a clear uh, need and desire for. Um, educational experience in this. I'd like to point out that, uh, uh, Laurie, you have a very nice uh, review coming out in RMD Open online, uh, um, uh, sister publication of ARD, and I, I would refer everyone uh, to that. I think that there'll be a, 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 a very enriched dialogue moving forward. So I want to thank you so much for joining us on eJournal Club. And uh, I would like uh, for all of you out there that have uh, joined us today, come back. We have a lot of great uh, um, uh, articles uh, and w with the opportunity to, imbue, uh, to re interview the uh, authors of these coming up over the next few months and uh, come to our website often. So thanks again. Thank you.